Welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. We wish to bring you a two-week series on the subject of international trade. In order to accomplish this, we're most happy to welcome to our program some guests during this two weeks and I want to at this time thank Lewis Clark State College in Lewiston, Idaho for for providing these guests to us. Uh, our guests have been in Coeur d'Alene and they're going on to Lewis State, uh, Clark State College for a symposium. On the first program, we're going to deal with maximizing your international potential. And in order to cover that important topic, I'm happy to join Steve Schink in welcoming four guests to our program. First of all is Moran Beck, who is Client Development Manager for the Northwest Trade Adjustment Assistance Center. Next to her is Sandy Necessary, who is representing the United States Department of Commerce during this symposium and discussion on our program. And then next is Tip O'Connor, who is the Vice President and General Manager of COT International uh, from Ireland, and we're happy to have him here with us. And our fourth guest is Lou Ann Soles, who is an international officer for the First Interstate Bank. On behalf of Steve and our staff, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the program. And at this time, I will invite the Director of Informational Services at North Idaho College, Steve Schink, to commence the questioning. Lou Ann, if I could begin with you, I wonder maybe we could set the stage just a little bit. Uh, we read all the time about uh, massive trade deficits, and uh, uh, it's sort of a discouraging uh, uh, bit of news that we pick up about how the United States is doing in terms of trading with foreign partners. From a Northwest uh, perspective, uh, what do you see in international finance in terms of uh, of how uh, companies in this part of the, of the world are doing in terms of getting into foreign markets? At this point in time, it hasn't looked very well because most of our products in the Northwest are, have been around agricultural products, mining products, forest products, um, and all of those are depressed areas. And unfortunately, with the protectionism that we're seeing at Capitol Hill now, uh, it may be that if, if strict protectionist legislation is, is, goes through, uh, will be even more susceptible to uh, closed markets because with agricultural natural resource products very often those are the first that are hit by other countries. There, has, there are individual groups, small to medium businesses, who have been doing relatively well in export markets uh, dealing in um, product, target marketing products. I have one customer I know of that has done quite well in exporting furs from the United States. Others who are doing well, TIP has customers who are doing well in, in uh, software products and in particular niches. Um, some of our forest products industries like Potlatch has begun to do quite well in exporting their paperboard from the Northwest by changing their product, upgrading it. It's not two by fours anymore necessarily. Uh, going into products that are in demand from my perspective, one of the things that bothers me the most as I've traveled around the world and looked at markets is the fact that in the United States we tend to expect that what we've already produced or what we already have is what's going to be wanted overseas. That's not always true. We don't always go out and do the market research that we should do in order to put new par products into overseas markets. Um, we've uh, done a lot of crying about our trade deficit and it always, I think, is interesting to watch everybody stand up uh, in front of the television cameras on Capitol Hill and talk about protectionist legislation. And I see them in their Harris tweed jackets and their Gucci shoes and their, uh, <laughs> uh, their Rolex watches. And uh, I think, well, you know, well, what are we really talking about? Uh, it's going to take a lot of work on our part, less than 10% of the U.S. companies in the United States export and fewer than 5% of our Fortune 500 companies do. So what it's really going to take is partially us going out and selling ourselves to the world like uh, countries like the Netherlands, uh, Japan, Korea, others have done before us. We're going to have to get out and scramble a little bit. In the uh, Pacific Northwest, we have a tendency to think in terms of Pacific Rim countries as, as uh, natural trading mm -hmm. partners. Uh, and I'd throw this open to anyone who feels comfortable with answering it. Uh, is that where we are indeed doing most of our trade in this part of the country, or are there other uh, foreign markets that, uh, that are actually more, uh, more attractive right now? 
Well, from our perspective in the banking business, we see an awful lot of it, of course, going into Asia. However, there are a lot of areas in Europe that uh, we were talking to a gentleman earlier today, and uh, he's looking at European markets. And potatoes, there's a possibility with the dollar going down that would be able to go into European markets. Uh, so I think it's, it's open for a lot of areas. And uh, of course, you always have your Latin American countries. But the one thing that we have to think about there is that we, unless those people can sell to us, they don't have the dollars to buy back from us. So again, you get into this sort of vicious circle of, of limiting areas. Ms. Necessary, I would like to direct a question to you. You, as I've indicated already, represent the U.S. Department of Commerce and deal with international trade. Uh, we hear a lot about imports and exports and certainly the balance of trade problem that we have um, concerning this issue. What is happening within the U.S. Department of Commerce or even other departments from the perspective of the government to assist business in this country to become more active in uh, exporting our products, and among other things, correcting this imbalance? Well, one of the things that the Department of Commerce does is promote exports. And we have a number of programs designed specifically to assist small and medium-sized companies to export their products. Uh, we can help companies find foreign buyers, uh, identify agents and distributors, uh, do market research for them to determine which markets are more suitable for their products, and help get them into trade exhibitions overseas so they can meet their foreign customers face to face, and things like that. And we have, uh, the Commerce Department has 48 district offices located around the country. And we also have our counterparts overseas in 130 locations. And both our overseas uh, staff and our domestic staff are linked together and they communicate with one another to provide these services and, and this information for the U.S. companies. You've already indicated that there are 48 offices within the continental United States, I believe, or within the 50 states uh, that businesses can contact to receive your services. Uh, when that happens, do you, with all the resources you have, which I know are rather sizable, do you have various categories for different businesses and you can move in rather quickly to assist them in whatever area they're interested in and also what parts of the world that that would be most productive to direct their attention toward concerning their product? Well, our, our trade specialists who are located in these offices are, have uh, expertise in, in most industries and, and they work with their clients in their districts on a one-on-one -on -one basis and they're familiar with the industries and the products in that region and then subsequently become familiar themselves with the markets for those products so they can be of more service to their clients. And the information is available to the trade specialist through many sources. Our program reaches uh, portions of four states in the Pacific Northwest and two provinces in Canada. I'm always interested in serving our viewers. Uh, for those businesses, what is the best location from where we're located for them to contact uh, the regional office? Well, there's, we have a branch office in Boise, Idaho, and that covers the state of Idaho and the state of Montana. Uh, we also have an office in Seattle, a district office, and we have an office, a branch office in Spokane. I also want to think of our Canadian viewers, and if particularly they are governmental entities or businesses in Canada that would like to have more of our products, if that's possible to go that way, they also could contact your office to give information that would be helpful to businesses in this country. Would that be correct? That's true, yes. Yes. Steve Sheen. Uh, Tip O'Connor, as, as an Irishman, you maybe have a little different perspective on what we're doing well and what we maybe are not doing quite so well at as Americans in terms of our efforts to, to uh, open up foreign trade markets. Any, any thoughts on that subject? Well, yes, many. Um, you know, the United States is the biggest market in the world. And up to very recently, there was really no need for the medium to small American manufacturer to export because the domestic market was so large. Now things have changed. Now the medium to small manufacturer needs exports. He needs to get his product out overseas. And it's amazing how much help there is available. Not only from people like me, but from the U.S. Commerce Department, Small Business Administration, and other agencies, government agencies. 
So if there are companies that uh, would like to grow and like to uh, increase their profits, export is definitely a very viable alternative than to um, maybe uh, spend a lot more money on the domestic market. If the, if the competition is severe in, the, in this market here, you may not find as much competition overseas. The main thing, however, is that uh, the, because there is no history and no tradition of exporting in the United States, there should be, uh, on the part of the exporter, a willingness to go through a learning curve. He's not going to turn around and make profits right away. He must invest some energy, time, and talent in, in, in getting, getting to know the market that he wants to penetrate. So I would say those are the important things. We, um, we in the United States have had such a tremendous impact on, on cultures around the world, and I sometimes think we uh, become kind of egocentric. We're a little blind to the fact that there are cultural differences. How often do any of you, in your experience, uh, see uh, United States business people uh, making mistakes in terms of their uh, their contacts with uh, with foreign markets because they don't appreciate or understand foreign cultures? Is that a real barrier? Mm -hmm. Well, it is. But the thing about it is that the other guys make mistakes too because our market is uh, not the same as any other market in in the world. So therefore, it's a two-way street. I think that the American businessman who goes overseas is is uh, is flexible in most cases to learn about the uh, the local culture, to learn uh, about the differences. Uh, there's the metric system is sweeping the world. We in the United States are a little bit behind in keeping up with that. So that's one uh, very obvious. The other one is dress. You know, it's very easy to pick out an American in uh, Hong Kong or Korea or, or Tokyo. Uh, so you know. As we opposed a, to an Irishman or an Englishman? Well, they're, they all look alike, yeah. you know, all these it's foreigners look alike. No, not, when I was, I was in China a couple of years ago, and it was interesting to see the difference because there were a number of Europeans at the hotel I was staying at in Beijing, and it was interesting to see that the Americans handled themselves differently than the Europeans did, particularly the Germans and the French. Um, and I think that one of the things that happens with Americans is that we don't make the long-term commitment to, uh, I did meet one gentleman when I was over there that was there from Boeing, and he told me that in seven years he had been there 53 times, and he left as many times without getting anything done as he did getting something done. But ultimately it had, it had been rewarded in some long-term sales. And I think the Europeans have been at that negotiation type of process longer than we have. It's always been rather quick and easy for us, and we're going to have to, do you agree with that, Dave? Oh, sure. You no. bet. But you know, the, the thing that I have seen over the years is that uh, the American businessman is, uh, a majority of, in the majority of cases, very anxious to learn mm -hmm. about the local customs, mm -hmm. very willing to accept different concepts and different ideas. So it's just a question of, of, of sticking with the program. Once he has decided to make the commitment, I think the American businessman is well received in almost every country in the world. Maybe not uh, necessarily the American government's point of view, but the individual American businessman. There's a lot of difference. I visited with a, a local manufacturer not too long ago uh, in Post Falls area, and that uh, that concern does a great deal of business with uh, Japan. And I and I can't help but notice when you visit their headquarters that all their signage is multilingual, mm -hmm. both American and Japanese. How big a factor is language? It can be a very large factor. Yes, it can. Um, but um, again, the majority uh, of count of uh, people who are um, from a different culture uh, do have a greater command of the English language mm -hmm. than we do of their languages in most cases. They're willing to spend the the time and the effort and to learn our language and to communicate with us as best they can. I think this is a good time to bring Ms. Beck into the conversation because we're talking about how to maximize your trade with other countries, and I'm particularly thinking, Ms. Beck, of the individual in business who has not yet taken that step forward to move beyond uh, our own borders. And since you're involved as a client development manager, you certainly have expertise that you can share with those. And I would like to address this question to you on behalf of those viewers who might be watching who are interested and they have not yet started this process. Uh, I would like for you to kind of give us a, uh, a chart of uh, the do's and don'ts. What, what should they do? Uh, and how should they become involved in the most uh, efficient and effective way? Well, one of the first things is to find out what types of programs are available for those businesses um, in their local areas. There are a vast number of economic development organizations 
um, both public and private, um, for those companies. Um, in, in Idaho, for example, as well as in most of the other um, states in the area, there are the small business development centers, which are good for the um, startups and companies that are developing a new product. Um, there, the Department of Commerce um, sector in um, Boise um, is a good place to contact to find out what other resources are available. Um, um, Northwest TAC, uh, the Trade Adjustment Assistance Center where I work, um, is another area. We help manufacturing companies um, who, as a matter of fact, are impacted by imports and help them figure out where they need to go. Now, one thing they need to concentrate on um, is that these economic development organizations are not going to take over the job for the businessman. Um, the business owner needs to, um, as Tip and Luann have stressed, develop a long-term um, plan. They have to dedicate their time and resources um, to determining where they want to go. It has to be a real commitment on their part. Uh, the organizations that are available for them are a tool. They're not a, they're not a magic answer. Nobody's going to take over and do it for them. Um, and I think that's, that's something that really needs to be stressed but the resources are available and they're all ready to help. I come to you as president of a corporation and again <laughs> this is our first endeavor and we are uninformed on this whole process what you're indicating uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you'd want to know what business I was in and so <laughs> forth. But what would be some of the things that you would ask me as a person who is totally new to the process even before you would even advise whether I should become involved? Um, well do you have a business plan? Um, do you have short term and long term? Um, what are you currently doing? What are your current markets? What do you see as potential markets? Um, how, do you, how, how do you handle your finances and your marketing, your production, engineering? What are your resources available in your company right now? Um, oftentimes businesses say they define themselves as I am a manufacturer of tennis shoes and they think of themselves only as tennis shoe manufacturers if instead they thought of themselves as um, suppliers to the market of uh, comfortable footwear they might find a different type of um, market for themselves using the expertise they have in-house maybe it's making um, oh, earth shoes or some such thing but something different where there is a market need but because they define themselves narrowly in the tennis shoe market they weren't able to see what else was outside. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Steve Sheen. Um, Maren, is the, is the uh, Northwest Trade Adjustment Assistance Center a private agency? Yes, it is private nonprofit. Um, we are funded by the U.S. Department of Commerce, um, but all of us are um, private sector um, um, employees. We, uh, we work with the companies in sort of a liaison situation between the private company that is um, requesting the assistance, the Department of Commerce which provides the funding, and then the private consultants who do the implementation of the projects with the manufacturing company. Um, a, a question for both you and, and Sandy. Um, how do our efforts as, uh, as U.S. government um, and its affiliates, uh, how do they compare to what we see the competition? Uh, what, kind of, what kind of resources? A lot is, is written about about the close association between Japanese business, for instance, and Japanese government. I don't mm -hmm. think we even approximate that, but mm -mm. No. what's your feeling about that? What's the appropriate role for government agencies in this arena? Well, in the United States, the, the role right now is, is as a support mechanism to facilitate uh, getting companies into exporting, making them aware of export markets and that sort of thing and, and helping them along the way putting them in contact with the right people to get them started. Should we be doing more as a government? Must we be doing more? If we're to compete with some of the other nations who do subsidize their their exporters I think we're going to have to start doing more. We do provide some tools for um, companies. I think some of the tools are not very well understood yet not being communicated well enough to the um, business person 
and oftentimes are perceived as being very long, drawn out, complicated procedures. And um, often they are. And maybe part of what we can do is help to simplify that. Can I add something on this? Uh, what, uh, your, your question was, uh, should we or could we be doing more? Uh, there's definitely a need for small to medium-sized companies to get a little help, primarily a little bit of financial help. We need to liberalize somehow or other, make a, a, a program available on a short-term basis so that they have some capital in which to go out and export their products or at least uh, determine whether in fact there's a market out there for them. And a lot of companies at the present time are so hard-pressed that they can't muster up that amount of uh, resources to go and do that. And in my opinion, that there's a lot of companies that would benefit greatly if they had a little more. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big giveaway program. It could be replaced uh, from the sale of the, uh, of the export uh, uh, commodities or whatever it might be. But uh, I think we're going to have to do a little bit more for the small to medium-sized companies to get them up and, and, and aggressive. To, uh, to use that, that answer as a springboard, and I'll capitalize on, on Tony's mythical uh, corporation and uh, on Marin's uh, shoe company, to ask you a question, uh, Luann. If, if uh, we own a, a shoe manufacturing concern, we've decided to produce earth shoes, and instead of marketing them in the mm -hmm. Midwest or back east or in, the, or in the southeast, let's say, you want to go overseas with it, how much more expensive is that going to be for us as a company than, than uh, marketing uh, domestically? It is more expensive. Not only is it more expensive in uh, your marketing, in your shipping, in your costs, which of course you're going to be involved in your end costs, but finding your markets over there, but you're also going to have a much longer turnaround usually in receiving funds back. And this is what I was thinking about when Tip and Everett, you were asking the question before. This is one of the places that we really do fall down. We have the support mechanisms, we have the information available, but when it really comes down to hard dollars, usually our exporters, whether they be small or large, very often, if they do go out, market themselves, have the ability to, say, ship a million dollars worth of goods to Taiwan or Korea or wherever, very often, unless they have the financial resources themselves, they cannot they don't have the resources to go out and buy the product to ship or to manufacture. I mean, if you're going to make tennis shoes or whatever, you have to have the products to manufacture that for. Where, because your banks are not allowed under ordinary conditions to lend against purchase orders or even under some, in most instances, letters of credit. Um, now, there are some programs available through the SBA, through XM Bank, through some of the other things that we have going if people know in time. But time and time again I have people come in my office. They have a potential market overseas. But all at once it looks like it's going to be so large that they don't have, as I say, the resources to go out. Now if I were a Japanese and I was in the reverse situation of that and I had a purchase order from the United States or I had a letter of credit or a whatever documentary collection. I can go into my bank there because the, J the government of Japan subsidizes or helps to subsidize a, a pre-purchase exporting type program. So then I could take that order in, letter of credit, whatever, receive my funds at a very preferential rate and be able to go back and, and, and purchase the product I need in order to, to uh, meet the deadlines of the export. So we aren't doing, I mean it's very, very difficult and I see this all the time. Um, some of the people have uh, gone into support programs. We do have a trading company with First Interstate Bank, but because, again, of constraints and so forth, they're usually more interested in a much larger type of uh, sale, you know, 30 million or so, which doesn't help our medium uh, to small businessman, which is really where the market availability should be. I have a question that any of you are free to address. We hear so much today in this country about the quality of life and uh, the economic uh, standard of living, and we certainly have moved drastically from a heavy industry society to a service industry, and that is affecting family income, and it's, uh, some statistics are, to me are rather disturbing how many jobs we're creating in the nine and $10,000 range. Is there anything that any of you are involved in or anything we can do in international trade that might address that problem so that we can maintain more of the jobs that are obviously a higher income than, than I have indicated. Let me take a shot at that, if I may, and then I'll pass it on to my colleagues here. Uh, you're absolutely right. We have uh, gone from a, uh, a manufacturing country 
to a service-oriented country, which is the lowest paying jobs that there are. In order to reverse that situation, it's necessary to uh, get deeply involved in research. Uh, new products, better quality, uh, again, as I say, more commitment to uh, exporting, because if you don't export and always buy from the other guy, you're always going to be at their mercy. They're the ones with the investment. In the past 10 years, the United States capital has been flowing towards what I call uh, passive investments, money, paper, certificates, uh, stocks, money that doesn't generate anything other than a little interest for the person who owns them. Uh, this has been, as the United States continues to grow older, the money is in the hands of the people who are more interested in security than they are in, in creating new investments, new opportunities. This must change. This is a, this is a, a, a policy for the total country. Financial institutions are, are uh, there's, even though there's many of them, they're all basically operating in the same modus operandi. They only will make a, uh, an investment if there's absolutely a guarantee that the thing is going to work. And if it doesn't work, what can we get in return? The venture uh, capital is very, um, it's very hard to get. I mean, really, risk-oriented capital is very hard to get in the United States. So as a result of that, I think we have to move in that, in that direction in order to get away from this service economy, which we're becoming a receiver of other people's goods and, and get into a more uh, aggressive position in, in exporting. We must have the better quality products, we must have the commitment to sell, and we must have the, uh, the capital behind us in order to be able to do it. Do you see that happening? Do you see a trend in that direction? Or? At the present time, I don't really. Uh, to be honest and frank with you, I don't. But uh, I think that uh, the people are beginning to uh, realize that we are becoming a service oriented, and that's the beginning of it right there, that the realization that we are at eight to ten thousand dollar a year new jobs for the kids that are coming out of the universities. So at least uh, there's an awareness happening. There's awareness, yeah. but the, the the community has to move, I think, a little bit more to the uh, entrepreneurial side. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I know Steve has other questions, and I do too. But on behalf of our staff, I want to thank all four of you, and again, I want to uh, thank Lewis Clark State College for making this possible. I can certainly testify to the fact it's been most informative, and you've been most helpful. Thank you again for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, our guests today have been discussing maximizing our international potential from the United States and international trade. I hope you've enjoyed this program. And may I take this opportunity to invite you to be with us for part two next week when, we, when some other guests, uh, sponsored by Lewis Clark State College, will join us in talking about barriers to international trade. I think you'll find that program equally beneficial to you in this important topic and how we turn around the trade issue. I would like to invite you to be with us at that time. And until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.